Prequel, The Walls in the Middle of Idumea, Chapter 4, The Fourth Day of the Week, Part A. Early the next morning, even before the milkmen were doing their rounds, Pear sat in his office with the most unusual collection of people. Two sergeants, two bleary-eyed but grateful to be their captains, Ralph and Banu, Banu's friend Matilda, who he had to remind was not on her way for a job interview, Mrs. Kale, the surgeon's diet-turned handwriting specialist, and 30 soldiers dressed as farmers. Since his office was large but not that large, it was quite a cozy fit. Many of them knew why they were there. Others weren't quite sure. But Pear realized he had to start trusting someone in the garrison. And these were the best picks he could come up with. I realize this is an odd morning, but I believe you will follow my, my lead and do as I ask. Perhaps we will need all of you men, perhaps we won't. However, there's a problem which has been growing right under our noses, and it's time it was addressed and resolved. Gentlemen, and our three ladies, I need your help if we're going to fix this city and this world. It's time to tear down the old lies and start letting new truths grow. Pear realized his speech wasn't doing much to clarify things, but only complicate matters. Some of his corporals, dressed as farmers, were likely worried that they were actually expected to plant something called truth so it could grow. Well, we best be on our way. There are ten wagons hitched up and ready to go. Choose your ride, I'll be in the lead, and whatever you do, remember this. We serve the citizens first. They filed out silently through the garrison headquarters, which wouldn't be seeing much action for another hour or so until the morning shift arrived, past the night shift soldiers on duty who wore perplexed expressions that the high general in his full blue uniform had had an early morning meeting with a bunch of farmers and three women. Soon the procession of wagons was rumbling down the cobblestone road. Pear told his driver to turn down one road before the mansion to the tracked lane that led to the adjacent old orchard. The rest of the wagons followed, and Pear wondered if the noise would wake anyone inside the thick walls of the mansion. The family downstairs, however, would be assembling for breakfast, as they had a few mornings ago at this time. Wordlessly, Pear signaled to his soldiers to disembark. He nodded to his chosen sergeants to replace the other soldiers standing guard at the rarely used side gate then pointed to the captains to head to the front gate to form the army guards on duty that early morning visitors were about to surprise the mansion. Pear nodded to his wife and her friend, who remained in the wagons with four soldiers and Mrs. Kale, while the bulk of his farmers started pruning the trees. If any of them actually knew what they were doing, Pear didn't care. They just had to look busy and it was a good way for them to be armed with sharp steel in their hands. They spread throughout the long orchard, working in pairs, scattered far enough apart to look like they belonged in the, ne the neglected farm, should someone pass by. Interestingly, no one ever passed by or approached. Pear was counting on that. The wagons pulled away to hide on a back road. Only two were to remain for the farmers. The one carrying Banu, Matilda, and Mrs. Kale would park over behind a thick stand of brush. Pear heard their quiet conversation before the wagon left. Mrs. Shin, so nice to meet you. I don't know if your husband told you, but I created a list of recipes for him. Oh, how kind, Mrs. Kale. You know, I have only 22 ways of cooking bacon for him. Do you have new bacon recipes? Bacon? No, Mrs. Shin, why... Bacon's on top of the list. Did he not give you that list? A list? Mrs. Shin, my recipes are all about replacing meats with vegetables. <gasps> Why would I do that? Banu was exclaiming when it mercifully their wagon started away. Pear knew Mrs. Kale was twisting on the bench to send him a look, but he was concerned with far greater issues than his weight. Near the sergeant's long tin and duvera, Ralph took his place, leaning against the high stone wall and eyeing it curiously. Pear winked at his son, and Ralph winked back. 
patting his side with the long knife was secured, but had never been used. Maybe today. Pear took a deep breath and marched up to the front gates, where his captain swung them open, and the lieutenants recently assigned there watched in question. The high general pointed at each of them and then to himself. Instead of remaining at the gates, the four young officers followed their high general to the front doors, where two of the king's green guards still stood, now fidgeting in worry. Pear finally spoke. Surprise inspection, boys. Open the doors now. The guards glanced at each other, at the four officers who were broader and stronger and wore heavier swords than they did, and then they each took a step away from the door. Pear frowned at their disobedience until one of the guards mumbled, Not locked, sir. Never is. Oh, really? Pear said. Good to know. Thank you. And, uh, by the way, go to the side gate on the south there. Things will get interesting soon, and I suspect you may want to be a part of it. You are part of the family, are you not? Both men stared at him with big eyes at his knowledge of the term, the family and Pear waggled his eyebrows and pointed in the correct direction, as if promising children where they'd find cake. He pushed open the doors, yes, no lock, how remarkably stupid, and the five officers strode in. One of the captains headed automatically for the throne room, but Pear shook his head. No one's there at this hour. We're going somewhere different. But, sir, I thought you said we're fixing the mansion. I've been waiting to find out exactly what kind of fixing you mean. You're all about to find out. If my guess is correct, and honestly, if frequently isn't, so just pretend I get it right the first time anyway, what we want is down this hall. Oops, nope, just as I warned you, down this hall. Faintly, he could hear the sounds of plates clattering and muffled conversation, and he led his men past several grand reception rooms, with tall ceilings and long drapes and cold fireplaces. The smell of fried eggs reached them, but before they turned down the last hall, Pear paused and turned to his men. With smiles, soldiers, smiles. They tried to copy him, and Pear began to think this might not work. But there wasn't enough time for a new plan. This one had taken all night as it was to arrange, and who know how much time Ralph and, more importantly, Clematis had, if she'd been found out. There was a killing squad assembling, and if there had been a message, a message before the one he retrieved yesterday, time may already be past. And where would Queen Jessie be on this early morning? He turned down the last hallway and found an open door, just as he almost predicted, and strode straight through it to screams and panic. He held up his hands as if in surrender and kept smiling as broadly as he could. Please, please, he called as more than two dozen people, many who had been sitting around a long table, scrambled into a corner as if they'd practiced this. My name is Pear, called out Fangy, and he broke from the clutches of someone who was likely his mother to rush over to him. Hi, Fangy, I told you I'd come back. And I dressed in my uniform today. His mother stood tall, reaching for her son and gesturing as if she'd been betrayed. You, you know this man. It's the new high general, Sally, said a middle-aged man, standing bravely in front of most of the family, his tone cold. I've seen you coming to visit Quarrel. Yes, I am, Pear said, with his most genial smile in place. And I've seen you answering the front door, wearing white gloves and ruffles. But this is a better look for you, a work shirt and no gloves. I never trust a man wearing white gloves. And I suppose you dress up only when you expect visitors at the front door? The doorman looked less stuffy and surprisingly more threatening as he stood his ground in front of the family, not saying a word but with his mustache twitching in annoyance. But many of the family were relaxing, glancing at each other, moving out of the corner. The high general was supposed to be safe. And I'm here to, well, I'm, I'm here to free you. I and my soldiers, 
It's my understanding that you've been here a great many years, and today it's time for you to move on. You can go now, free. Doors open, we've got rides, you can pack a few things. Shall we go? They stared at him, dumbfounded. No one moved. Fangy shrugged. I don't think we want to go, Pear. The family gazed at him as if he announced that the color orange tasted like how a horse smells. They couldn't comprehend anything he was saying. Pear wasn't expecting this. He rather thought a few of them would be eager for a change of pace, but not a single person shifted their position. A captain stepped up, a young man with a pleasant demeanor. Everyone, we realize this is sudden, but we are here to help you. It's not natural that you've been shut up in this mansion for so long, and we're here to let you out. The doorman stood taller. He merely cleared his throat, and the entire family tightened up into the corner again. Pear had seen that behavior with a guard dog and a flock of sheep. It barked a certain way, lunged another, and the flock obeyed. Thank you, the doorman said formally. You may now leave. The captain looked at Pear perplexed, but Pear said, I get it. You think this is a trap, don't you? And you seem to be the leader here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Nor will you, he said staunchly. It was a mistake for Fangy to reveal his name, even to a uniform, but I'll not make that mistake. Although, you just revealed that Fangy's mother's name is Sally, Pear pointed out. No, don't worry. I'll forget that so you can stop that eye twitching. You think we're here to harm or trick you? Pear nodded sadly. Sir, I need to call you something during our negotiations. Clearly, you're a man to be reckoned with. So, if you won't tell me your name, may I call you Reckon? He stood staunchly, immovable. But a woman behind him smirked, and another smiled a little proudly. One may have been his wife, maybe the other a daughter. Pear nodded once. Reckon, sir, we're not here to harm or worry you. We're here to offer you something you've never had before. A chance to live as you wish. Why? Reckon demanded. The other captain next to Pear threw up his arms. Because why not? Why not choose where you want to live and do as you wish? Because that's not possible and everyone knows it, a woman in her fifties exclaimed. You're trying to lure us out, to sacrifice us to some unknown something. Where's Quirrell? What have you done with him? Where's Grandmother Jessie? Grandmother, the captain recoiled. Lunge... Reckon lunged unexpectedly for a pipe on the wall, but Pear held back the lieutenant who was about to wrestle it out of his hands. The man shouted into it something that sounded like intruders, but it was so garbled and panicked that Pear wasn't sure. I knew this would happen, a younger woman whimpered, sheltered in the arms of a young man. As soon as they forced back the cousin guards and replaced him with that blue, she spat in disdain, I knew it would be the end. Sir, one of the captains turned to Pear with a low voice. I don't think this is going as we thought it would. Honestly, Pear whispered back, I hadn't thought at all how it would go. So to me, it's going just fine. But I've got an idea. He turned back to the family, who had rearranged themselves. The women were against the wall, and the men had formed a shield before them. One of them was waving at Fangy to come back to their group. But Fangy was too curious, admiring the patches on the uniform of the captain who stood before him. Please, Pear tried again. You can see that Fangy's not afraid of me. And he nudged the boy to go back to his mother, who was frantically motioning for him to join her. And I know that you have two revered and ancient grandparents sleeping downstairs. May we please speak with them? Together. I think they might be able to help explain some things. He'd been counting the heads. Twenty-eight, a few more than he expected, which meant with the two old people, the two guards he'd already sent to the gate, and Clematis, there were thirty-three in total. Wait. Where's Clematis? he asked heavily. 
The huddle of family examined each other, looked around, and then a woman called out, Clematis, where are you? Pear swallowed when there was no answer, and Fangy looked over at him, his dark eyes worried. I haven't seen her yet this morning, he confessed. It was easy to tell who her parents were. They were the most agitated. Pear caught the eye of the mother. Did she wake up easily this morning, eager to tend the chickens? How do you know she doesn't like to get up in the morning? And she hates the chickens, she snarled. I know teenagers, Pear said kindly. No one ever wants to wake up early, especially for chickens. Did you see her this morning, he pressed. The woman shook her head and looked to a man in front of her. He turned, panic rising in his voice. I thought you got her up. She wasn't in bed. Pear resisted the urge to draw his sword, but said instead to his officers, Gentlemen, we need to sniff out Queen Jessie. She'd never hurt us, another woman called out. Never. Why don't you sound so sure of that, Pear demanded. No one from the sheep huddle answered him. Dear Creator, he whispered, because now seemed like a good time for another prayer, even if he didn't know more than to call on his name. They had reason to fear Jesse, which made his fear increase as well. Fan out, he ordered his officers, and they took off like lightning out the door. They knew how to work together to clear rooms, but it was a very large mansion. And now, Pear wished he'd called for the 30 farmers to join him earlier. Someone had suggested that during their all-night planning session. He couldn't remember now why he rejected having all the soldiers storm the mansion. No, he saw it now. Considering the skittishness of the family, who stared at him in dread, they would have thought they were being invaded. Five men in blue was more than enough to terrify them. Plus, it would take them a few minutes to find the old queen, and Pear could use this time. I am on your side, he said in a soothing manner. Banu always said he could smooth talk a saw into a salamander, although he thought the comparison an odd one. Clematis' parents, you don't have to cower there. You're free to go look for her. Maybe she's at the outhouse or braiding her hair. Her parents looked uncertainly at the rest of the family, but then broke ranks and darted for the door, calling for Clematis. The high general turned back to the rest of the family, half of whom looked like they wanted to go help, the other half eyeing Pear suspiciously. Anything could be a trap. I understand your reticence about Jezzy, he told them. You may or may not know this, but she has employed killing squads for decades now. Whoever displeases her or speaks out against the king She'd have them killed. No inquiry, no trial, no negotiations. I recently outlawed those squads in my position as high general, but she's made no sign to disband them. Nor, frustratingly, do we even know who is on the squads. He met the eyes of each of the men in the room, and to his relief, they looked horrified. Anyone? he asked carefully, although he doubted if any of them had ever left the grounds in their lives. They all shook their heads. I came to the mansion earlier this week for the first time, trying to find a way in which in may have been a secret entrance. I found a few. Some of you know about the secret passageways, don't you? He could read their guilty faces, and he smiled knowingly at them. Melting them like butter, Banny would say. His honeyed tones, his syrupy smile. He always craved pancakes when she talked that way, and now he remembered he hadn't had breakfast. His smile slid away. I was looking for passageways when I came, because I've been worried about Coral's wife, Margot. She's been missing for weeks now, with no sightings reported anywhere, and I fear she's dead. Several in the family glanced miserably at each other, as if he were verifying what they were thinking. And the last known person to interact with her was Queen Jessie. I wonder if her killing squad had anything to do with her disappearance. I heard that Margot wasn't happy here. I'm guessing some of you can attest to that. Now many of the family were squirming, and Pear watched Fangie's mother. 
Her head was down as she stroked her son's fuzzy black hair. Pear put the pieces together. It must have been hard for Margot to live in a house where her husband could, at a moment's notice, be used as breeding stock to increase the number of servants. He smiled in sympathy. She had a hard life here, and I'm sure all of you did your best to make her time softer. But I'm afraid she's gone now. I snuck in here looking to see how she may have been taken out, if that's what happened. And worryingly, none of you ever knew I was here. You have guards, but they're pitifully ineffective. I got in, was here for over half an hour, and got out undetected. You may wonder why I had your matching guards removed. It's because my soldiers will truly keep you safe, especially from threats younger, faster, and skinnier than me. Now there was more fidgeting, especially among the men who seemed to believe they were guarding the family well, but not well enough. What I didn't expect, Pear continued in his sugared tones, was to find a charming young man delivering wood or to find that he has a large and loving family behind him. I can feel your affection for each other, and only because you've supported each other so well have you endured for this long. I'm deeply impressed, and deeply concerned for you as well. My duty is to protect the citizenry, and I didn't even know there were citizens here to protect. Reckon folded his arms. We are protected, sir, very well here. Our guards did their duty. You just got lucky. Sir, Pear said to him, with all due respect, no, I was not lucky, and you were not well protected. You see, I snuck in here a second time, and with another person, and was listening in to your breakfast through that very wall. Had I been less someone less trustworthy, I could have killed you all. Sir, how many blades do you see me wearing right now? Members of the family were now paling, drawing within themselves. Pear could discern who the former guards were. They were huffing silently. Reckon tried to firm his stance. Your sword, high general. Pear removed it and set it on the table between the platters of eggs and toast and bacon, which made his belly rumble. Easily spotted. But I have three more. No one who was pressed up against the wall, the wall where he supposedly had listened in to them, seemed to like that response. Pear bent over and pulled out the long knives from his boots, setting them on the table. Then he slid his hand up his sleeve and removed the third long knife. I remove these weapons as an act of peace, of goodwill. I don't want to hurt you, I never did. But I fear there are those in this mansion who do, and have. I fear for your lives. Please may we speak to the grandparents who sleep downstairs in that room where he rolls the yarn and she knits it. How can you know all of this? Reckon whispered harshly. Pear's smooth, melty smile was back. I told you, I've been here before, and I know a fast way to get down there. He approached the wall and hoped he guessed rightly. There was a shallow floor-to-ceiling shelf with a few narrow dishes on the shelves. With his audience keeping a watchful eye on him, he removed the dishes and hoped there wasn't a lock somewhere. Putting all of his weight behind the effort, and any lock would have struggled mightily against it, he yanked on the shelf. It broke away with a loud crash to reveal a dark stairwell behind it. Pear was careful not to sigh in relief that the passage was there. Gasping, the family moved as one body behind Pear to peer into the darkness. I forgot that was there, someone murmured. Me too, said another voice. Pear stepped into the darkness. Would you like to follow me? Someone handed him a candle, and he led the procession down the stairs. For nearly thirty people, they were shockingly quiet likely too astonished to make much noise. But he heard whispers of, didn't we play here as children? And, well, this would have made mill times easier. Can't believe no one told me this was here. Soon he was at the double doors at the bottom. He handed the candle to a man in his twenties who was awestruck, 
Then Pear wrenched open the false shelf door and pushed open the closet door. Well, I'll be a hornet's middle. The man didn't finish his sentence to Pear's disappointment, but followed him out into the wide hallway, as did everyone else. Pear kept his voice low when he said, Would someone be so kind as to wake up your great-grandparents? Whose grandparents are they, anyway? People were trickling out of the stairwell, a few calling down the hall for clematis, but of those who heard the high general, every one of their hands went up. So did Pear's eyebrows. Well, in a way, they're related to all of us, one middle-aged woman explained. They're sort of together now as they were in the past. Then there were others they were together with who have died, so now we just keep them together. You know what I mean? Pear smiled understandingly, although he hadn't followed most of that. I'll just go wake them, she offered and slipped into the door. The yell of, Visitors! nearly made Pear jump out of his boots. A bit deaf they are, someone else told him. I can see how they became that way, Pear gripped back, and a few people chuckled with him. Sixth lesson in diplomacy, get your opposition to laugh with you. Pear should teach that class in command school. After some loud exchanges of, Visitors, who'd visit us? And, What time is it? And, Why visitors? The door opened again, and out came two elderly people, rumpled and confused, shuffling into the dim hallway and stopping abruptly when they saw the large officer in blue. Good morning, he said kindly. Please forgive the rudeness of this early hour. Clearly, I have no manners. He was surprised to hear how many quiet chuckles there were behind him. The family was warming up to him. But your names, please? This is Danny, said the woman who woke them up, patting the elderly man's shoulder. The old couple was squinting at him. Pear could tell Danny's eyes were gray and cloudy. He squinted just for show. And this is Serafina. Nice to meet you, sir, ma'am. Danny, may I ask, how old are you? Danny cleared his throat, stood taller, and said, I don't really know. Pear suspected as much. Sir, how old were you when the Great War started? Ha, that I know, he said proudly. I was seven years old. What about me? Serafina demanded. Don't you want to know my age? No, ma'am, Pear said gravely. My wife has said that I should never ask a woman her age. That made everyone laugh, and Pear knew he had them practically in his back pocket. A wise wife you have there, Serafina smiled showing her few remaining teeth. But you may be interested to know that I'm three years older than Danny. I was probably 11 when the war began. Congratulations, Pear said, ignoring the problem with the math, and clapped his hands in delight. Now, my dear Serafina and Danny, how old were you when the Great War ended? Danny scoffed, as did everyone else around Pear. It hasn't, sir. It still rages on in the world. Several voices murmured their agreement. Then notice that the high general hadn't said a word. Pear waited until all was silent, then asked, How do you know it hasn't ended? Danny hemmed and guffawed and harumphed before he finally said, well, that's, that's how it's always been. What are you, part of the army? Why aren't you out there fighting for us? Because, Pear said, the biggest battle is going on right here in this basement. What are you talking about? Are we under attack? Serafina's voice pitched higher. Get to the safe areas, she began to wail, but Pear caught her flailing arms. No, ma'am, there's no attack, but there has been a great injustice for far too many years. He was interrupted by Clematis' parents rushing down the stairs to the hall. We can't find her anywhere, her father panted. Something's wrong. Agreed, Pear said. Fan out, he ordered the family, forgetting that they didn't know what that meant. Search every room, under every bed, behind every sofa and chair, and in those storage rooms. My men will have the upstairs cleared any moment now, so let's make sure she's not down here. Move! 
They moved, rushing into every room, calling her name, while Pear took a deep breath and he noticed the wall panel down about 15 paces where he and Ralph had emerged from the passage that led outside and where they listened in to the morning routines a few days ago. She knows, he murmured, and he was surprised to discover Clematis's mother at his elbow. Who? she asked urgently. Which she? Both of them, Jessie and Clematis. Stories floated around the army for years that Queen Jessie had secret ways. She always seemed to know what her husband and the army leaders were planning, because she was undoubtedly spying. She'd burst into the throne room at the most opportune moments and declare this or that was wrong. It's that hideous dog painting in the throne room. I'm betting she even painted it. The woman knows no subtlety. She'd hide behind it, I'm sure. I did too, Clematis's mother whispered. I discovered it on accident, and I knew I shouldn't be there once when I was a girl, but Jessie found me. Beat me for it, she confessed miserably. I'm very sorry, Pear whispered back. Did you ever tell your daughter about the passage? Oh, no. Oh, I wouldn't want Jessie angry with her, too. So she found it all by herself, Pear said to her mother's astonishment. Because she's a smart girl, a very smart girl, he said. She knows Jessie's secrets, ma'am. Lots of them, I bet. And one of them is that panel in the wall here. Find your husband. I could use his help. An instant later, Clematis's father was rushing to Pear. The rest of the family was still rummaging around the basement and calling for the missing teenager. Here, Pear said, and scraped aside the hidden door panel. Clematis's mother exclaimed, I knew I heard a noise the other morning. Sorry, but it was me. You nearly caught me, too, Pear smiled sadly. They peered up into the dark stairwell. Clematis, Pear shouted. A muffled something came back, and Clematis's father turned to the hallway to shout, Silence! to hush up the family. At the hole in the wall, he again shouted his daughter's name. Another odd sound came down, nothing that Pear could identify. He met the eyes of Clematis's father, and without another word, the men started running up the stairs. That's not the smartest thing to do in the pitch dark. And soon they were stumbling over each other at their, in their race to the top. Clematis's father trampled Pear in an effort to get past him, giving Pear a new headache and reviving an old knee injury. A light, he called down the stairs, rubbing his head as Clematis's father shouted her name over and over. An older man rushed up with two candles in his hands, followed by three younger men. The passage goes both ways, Pear told them. To the left, you'll come out at that narrow stairs that leads to your outhouse. To the right, well, I don't know. I didn't get any further than this. More candles in the hands of more men came up the stairs, and the dust and clutter of years of disservice were soon eliminated. I know I heard something, Clematis's father insisted, looking down one way then the other, unsure of which to take. I did too, Pear said. Try the right with some of these men. A few others, follow me to the left. Watch your steps, there are rat remains here. He almost didn't hear the faint creaking to the left, but something nudged his mind and he headed toward the secret door Ralph had found first. Men followed him and he wished they'd be quieter so he wouldn't miss another subtle sound. Soon he was at the door and he worked his fingers into the narrow gap to pull it open. The men behind him exclaimed in surprise to find they were in the outhouse hall. But Pear was already outside the mansion, examining every large shrub and every stone for someone hiding behind. He nearly missed it. The flash of cloth that disappeared behind a tall berry bush against the mansion. Without a word, he raced over to it, men on his heels. Behind the thick bush, was a stone wall of the match? No, wait, not entirely. There was another false wall, only halfway up, with a door made of wood skillfully painted to look like stone, and it was closing, closing in on a boot. Pear lunged over the bush and grabbed the boot, preventing it from slipping into the new passageway. Although he tumbled to the ground, crushing the poor plant, 
He did not let go of that boot, but hauled on it with all of his strength, as if fighting the heaviest catfish in the river. He dragged out a leg attached to a raging, screeching voice that rebounded in muffled tones in the passageway. You slagging, filthy blob of a man! He nearly dropped the leg in surprise, but instead firmed his grip and yanked his hardest, hearing a satisfying thump as the owner of the voice undoubtedly banged a body part on its way out. It was nasty labor, the creature which the poor mansion was birthing, but when Pear finally retrieved the thrashing body he, that didn't want to be extracted, he placed a firm boot on its belly to keep it from escaping, and he sneered in delight. Jezzy, he announced as the rest of the family circled around him in shock. You're far too fat to go crawling under the mansions, and you, madam, are no longer lovely. Not that you ever were. Her head was gashed and bleeding, her face filthy with muck, and she was dressed not in her silk gowns or even in her bedclothes, but in old green trousers and a man's shirt dirt brown. She continued to thrash like a wild animal or like a toddler having a temper tantrum. What in the world are you doing? Pear demanded and stepped harder on her belly so that she quit flailing but writhed in pain. Trying to sneak yourself or someone else out or in. Stop it, one of the men said. Can't you see you're hurting her? Yes, yes, Jessie cried, suddenly producing tears and wailing like a delicate lady. You see what this brood of a soldier is doing to me. The commotion of Pear's capture had brought the rest of the searchers outside, and Clematis's father came around the bush, glaring at Jessie. Where is she? Where's my daughter? Jessie wasn't much of an actress, Pear noted, because her fake crying suddenly shifted to smugness. She's gone, Jezzy said, trying to sit up, but Pear wasn't about to let her, not until his officers returned. And where were they, anyway? She said she hated it here, Jezzy continued, and I told her, fine, she wants to leave, I'll let her leave. I even helped her. That's why I'm dressed like this, so that no one would recognize me. She took off this morning after some boy, she saw. She was always a sour one, anyway. What? her father roared, and even if Pear had been sitting on the old queen, there was no way he could have held her back from the fury of Clematis's father. He grabbed Jezzy by the shoulders and hauled her up, slamming her against the stone wall of the mansion. Pear winced at the new bump the old queen would have on the back of her head, but he didn't feel too badly about it. She'd never leave! Her father shouted at her. Where is she? What do you do with her? Pear had forgotten about the two guards in green, who likely had been standing obediently by the thick wooden side gate down the rock wall on the other side of Pear's sergeants, but they had come over to see the action. Now they were perplexed as to who they should be guarding, Jezzy or Clematis's father. Pear suspected they'd never actually confronted anyone in their entire guarding careers. They were merely for show, and right now they were merely watching the show. Around the other side of the mansion came the four officers, surrounding Coral IV, still in his lavender silk nightshirt, and his two sons in tow, rubbing the sleep out of their eyes. The soldiers were running the king's family to the scene, where Coral IV stopped and stared wide-eyed at his mother being slammed again against the stone wall. Shin, the fourth cried out, have him release my mother. Why, Pear said, so that I can have a turn at her? She's done something with Clematis. The fourth frowned. Mother? But Pear wasn't going to wait for her lies. He was already indicating to the slender lieutenants. In here, he gestured to the half door in the wall. This isn't a foundation access, but a passageway. Go in there and pull out what you find, very, very gently. Clematis's mother crouched next to Pear and peered in. Clematis, are you in there? The officer scrambled in, and it was only moments later that their muffled shouts came out. Pear swallowed and prayed, please let her be alive, please let her be alive. He kneeled at the passage next to Clematis's mother, 
trying to make out in the gloom what his officers were doing, but it was impossible until one came out backwards, carefully dragging a body. Her ankles were bound in silk scarves. Then came her torso, with wrists bound by more silks, dyed scarlet. Then finally her head, cradled awkwardly by the second lieutenant, trying to move her and crawl out at the same time. Clematis's eyes were only halfway open, her brown skin tinted blue, and Père knew why. More silks, several and very thick, were wrapped around her mouth and nose, suffocating her. Give me your knife, Pear cried out as the soldiers propped up the teenager and her mother fumbled with the silks on her wrists. That wasn't the problem, Pear knew. With his lieutenant's blade in hand, Pear ordered, Hold her still, we need to get her breathing again. There was no clear knot to slice off, so Pear glanced at the girl's mother. She understood immediately and nodded. She'll heal. Do it fast. Pear slid the knife as gingerly as he could up under the silks along Clematis's cheek. Then he began to saw through the cloth, the blade facing him, as fast as he could without nicking her flesh. Within seconds, the silks began to give. Then one layer and another and another fell away, until Clematis was freed and gasping. Pear stood up and away so that her father could smother her with her mother, but Clematis was pushing him away with her still-bound hands and forced her eyes open. Pear, she gasped, Jessie! I know, I know, he assured her. We've got her under guard. He looked to make sure, and the captains had their swords out and pushed right up against Jessie, one blade pressing against her ample belly, the other positioned where her heart should be if she had one. With her back flat against the wall, she had nowhere to go. Although she was throwing angry glances at her son, who looked as if he wasn't sure where he was. No, Clematis tried again. Ralph! She's after Ralph! I know, Pear said warmly, crouching again next to her and ignoring the pain in his knee which hated the motion. Clematis, you were so very brave to warn me. Thank you so much. He's safe. No, she tried her best to sit up, the color coming rapidly back to her face. He's not. A killing squad has been sent. I know, Pear said again, and I told them where to go and when. And if they follow the note, they'll be here right now and also in custody. Jessie heard that and screeched, Impossible! Pear was about to respond to that, but suddenly he was struck with a thought. Clematis, how did you get under there? There's no way Jessie could have brought you down. Is there another exit? Clematis shrugged. I don't think so. Pear spun to Jessie, but she was suddenly very tight-lipped. Back in there, Pear ordered, gesturing to the passage. No, none of the family, he called as Clematis's father tried to climb in there. Someone armed and skilled. Never mind, I'm going first. The space was big enough, but more importantly, he was angry enough. He crawled through the gap, encountering a dirty planked floor and low clearance, maybe only four feet high. He strained to see in the darkness, but soon a candle was given to him, which he snatched as the lieutenants crawled in after him. The area was broader than he expected, the flickering flame not casting far enough light to the ends of it. To the corners, he whispered to his officers, and nodded which directions he intended. He'd go up the middle, hoping to flush out whatever or whoever might be hiding there. It was dank and smelled like old urine, but as he crawled forward, he could see the end of the space less than twenty paces ahead, the inner foundation of the stone mansion. On the ground ahead was old cloth, perhaps canvas from past construction, but because it was conveniently rolled up, Pear headed straight for it. His lieutenants were sharp enough to see his clambering, and they converged on the rolled canvas at the same time. It seemed to take a breath. Pear flopped on top of it, crushing it with his full weight, and heard a muffled grunt come from its interior. Gotcha! And rolled up for suitable moving. What an obvious hiding place. No, don't bother checking the cloth, Pear said to a lieutenant, who was attempting to peer into the open top. I think I know what we've got here. From under the now squirming bundle, 
he wrenched out a crushed straw hat with brim. This is our man. Let's drag him out of here and keep it tight. They dragged the rolled bundle out of the passage, letting it bang and bump along the way. Clematis's father was waiting, bouncing in fury, ready to punch something. Pear stood up and handed him the hat. It's part of the uniform, I suspect. Have to know who's on your side, and it's not so easy to toss away. Hold on to this. The lieutenants were now unrolling the bundle, several men of the family standing by as support. What was revealed at the end was indeed a man, scowling and furious, his face smeared with soot and muck. Pear didn't know if his filth was a result of his adventures that morning or an attempt to disguise his appearance. He was immediately taken up by Quarrel's former guards. Pear wasn't sure that they were up to the task, but there were four of them. One of them said almost pleasantly, Hey, what are you doing under there? You know him? Pear asked. Only by, well, not by face, but certainly by body shape. He's always picked up the messages in the morning. One of the captains exclaimed, That's the man, sir, the one we wrote about in our report, the one no one wanted to investigate, so they had us transferred instead. And there was another one at, at dinner time, right? Also wearing that style of straw hat. The one at night could have been that man. I, I'm not sure. Pear turned to Quirrell the Fourth, who looked to his mother. That was always his strategy. What would mother say? Jessie thrust her chin into the air and looked high into the sky at nothing. Pear said, I think I know who insisted that Stumpy have you transferred. He turned back to the man now being held by four of the family. In the captain's report, they described a thin, shorter man, but exceptionally strong, as if he were muscle through and through, and fully capable of carrying off Clematis. Pear took the hat from her father, who had been smashing it in his hands, and plopped it onto the new prisoner's head. Nice fit. Easy uniform. Can barely make out your face and certainly not your eyes. Is this what every assassin in your killing squad wears? So you can identify each other, then toss away the evidence? His glower was intense, but Pear was tired. He hadn't slept all night, so the glare did nothing to him. How many in a squad, in this squad, sent to take out Clematis? The man said nothing. All right, then here's my theory. There are headstones, grave markers, throughout these grounds. I suspect many of them are your squad's victims. People who Jezzy the Turnip hated had you kill, then you threw their bodies over the wall. Quiet gasps behind him from the family turned him part way. A younger man, likely a former guard, said, There were bodies thrown over the wall, but they were part of the war. Pear searched the faces of the family. Yes, they all believe that. He paused when he saw the old man called Danny, who had joined everyone else outside, Serafina by his side. You told me earlier, Danny, that the Great War began when you were a boy, but that it didn't end. Didn't end, one of his lieutenants whispered. Pear held up his hand to keep him quiet. Danny, what year was that? Danny frowned as he pulled out the memory. The year 195. That's right. Lieutenant, he turned to a surprise officer. Please tell us what year the Great War ended. It's question number two on the command school admissions exam. Certainly, sir. The Great War ended in 200, five years later. Everyone among the family shifted positions, startled and disbelieving. Someone muttered, that's a lie. Captains, Pear called out, would you please confirm the date that the Great War ended? The year 200, they chorused. Thank you. But Pear could see the family wasn't about to believe it. So he turned to Quirrell the Fourth, whose entire demeanor was wilting. Fourth. When did the Great War end? Remember, there are army witnesses here. He shrank more in his silky nightshirt, seemed to think about the question, then shrugged. In 200. What? Came dozens of responses from the family, but Danny was slowly shaking his head. Pear walked over to him and placed a gentle hand on his shoulder. 
Sir, do you know what year this is? No, Danny said, his voice quivering. We kind of, kind of stopped keeping count, I guess. Sir, it's 280. The Great War has been over for 80 years, sir. 80 years. Pear was afraid the news was actually going to kill him, the way the old man fainted on the spot. But fortunately, he wasn't heavy, and Pear easily caught him and gently laid him down between two headstones among the blackberry bushes. Two older women, maybe his daughters, rushed over to fan his face. Serafina, however, the oldest of the group, stood firm and trembled in fury. Why? she demanded and Pear wasn't sure who her question was addressed to. If this is true, then why keep us here? Jessie, answer me! Queen Jessie was still inspecting the approaching dawn, defiant and mute. Forth began to open his mouth, but his mother suddenly let out a screech of fury, and he clamped it shut again. His two young sons just stared stupidly. I have a theory. Pear said when he realized that no one else would answer Serafina. Surveying the family only added substance to his theory. There were at least six very boopable noses of varying ages, likely more. He needed to get closer to be sure. Serafina, he began, then hesitated. I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. My last what? she asked, still glaring bitterly at Jessie. Uh, never mind. Serafina, you were a child when the Great War first began. How many of you were living in the mansion at the time? She pulled her gaze to look at Pear. My parents, Danny's parents, then their grandparents, she gestured to a vague cluster of people. Then Danny and me. Eight of you? You were likely old enough to be a servant, so seven as servants? Then I assume your parents and the others had more children? Serafina's glare was back on Jessie, then over to Quirrell, who shrank a little. The first took us in as a safety measure, she said, her voice calming slightly. It was a terrifying time. Fighting was very close. I know that. I remember that. The captain cleared his throat, but Pear shook his head. History lessons would come later. They made us rooms down in the storage area so we could stay during the worst fighting. They set up their old furniture, gave us bedding. After a while, it just seemed easier to stay every day instead of going home. We moved in, she explained. Do you recall how far into the war this may have been? Pear asked. She mulled that over. I had a birthday shortly after we moved in. I think I was 12. And you may be 91 or 92 now? She nodded proudly. I remember my numbers. She stood up taller. That's another thing. I used to go to school, she suddenly remembered. I, I learned letters and reading and numbers. Math. They called it math. But Quirrell the first said school was too dangerous and that General Shin. Did they ever close the schools during the Great War? Pear turned to the captain, who seemed to be brimming with history lessons. No, ma'am, the captain answered her. I'm sorry to tell you, but the fighting never actually reached the interior of Itamia. Only on the outskirts and only a couple of times. Schools never shut down in the city, and only for a few moons at a time in the surrounding villages. Serafina's fists were in balls now, trembling with rage. I liked learning, she seethed. Jessie finally dropped her chin. This wasn't my fault! She yelled at Serafina. I wasn't even in the mansion back then. I didn't come until years later. Then why did you keep us? Serafina raged back. Pear had noticed the family was clumping around her, either to hold her up or to hold her back. A couple of older men shared her features. They were likely her sons, sturdy men in their late sixties or early seventies, and their faces were hardening in shared anger. And, sadly, they had very boopable noses. You did this on purpose, didn't you? Serafina demanded. You, you, you're just as bad as all of them. You kept us for, 
For what? Convenience, Pear said, glaring it forth. Built-in, homegrown servants. Slaves, if you will. That finally got a rise out of Quirrell. They're not slaves. Look at what they're wearing. They dress finer than anyone else out there. We took care of them, fed them, loved them. Love them a little too much in some cases, I'd bet, Pear bellowed. He tapped his nose, then pointed at Forth's. Forth shifted guiltily, but he wasn't finished. The, the world was, is a dangerous place. We protected them, kept them away from all of that. All of what? Pear held out his arms. There's still some fighting, sure, but only with garters and only a couple times a year. And the only ones who get injured or die are usually my soldiers. You know where the greatest danger is? Here. How many bodies has your family buried in this yard over the past 80 years forth? How many? Quirrell didn't answer immediately, but bobbed his head. I'm not sure. Shall we count? Give a lesson in counting to your servants as we do so? How many of you can count higher than 10? 20? Clematis can count higher than 100 now, so let's start with these stones right here. Look, three bodies buried here. I'm assuming that's what those crude tally marks signify. And no names. Jesse's work, isn't it? Come on, Quirrell. More than one body per stone and etched with only slashes on it? How many? Forth's jaw was going up and down now, his eyes darting around the family looking for a friendly face. He paused on Fangy's mother, but she was slowly shaking her head, baffled. Soldiers, Pear shouted. How many citizens has the world lost to garters since the end of the Great War 80 years ago? This is on the latest report issued on army conflicts, so I expect at least one of you should have read it. Their responses were a little slower, and Pear noticed out of the corner of his eye his young officers mouthing numbers to each other and shrugging in agreement. Finally, they seemed to have come to a consensus, and one of them made to respond, but Pear held up his hand. First, I want to hear the number from Quirrell or Jezzy. A rough estimate, if you don't mind. How many of the king's enemies have you buried here over the years, throwing them over the walls and pretending the Great War killed them, starting with Quirrell I? Forth was staring at his mother, who was beginning to realize she had no friends anywhere. Well over 200, said a low voice Pear hadn't heard yet. He'd nearly forgotten about the muscled prisoner held by the family and twisted to see his dull eyes. The queen may have records, I don't know. But according to my records, you're not supposed to have any, Jezzy shrieked. Have to make sure I get paid properly, the man explained calmly to Pear, ignoring Jezzy's continued shrieks of, traitor, traitor. Good thing she doesn't have a killing squad to come after you now, Pear said dryly. His prisoner scoffed. Stale biscuits, there must be more than one killing squad. Over 200, the man repeated, and Pear began to realize his voice was familiar. His gut twisted as the man continued. That's how many we've dumped here over the years, more elsewhere, he added, as Jezzy continued to throw a fit in spite of the swords on her. I'm a dead man anyway, I've got nothing to lose. Let me see that fat sow suffer and I'll give you my records. Stunned, Pear couldn't respond, but only stepped aside to give the man a clear view of Jezzy. Muddy, bleeding, in hideous clothing, and now screeching like a stuck cat. The man nodded. I always hated her, but she pays well. How could you? Pear snarled at him, finally finding his voice. You're an officer. What? One of the captains exclaimed, nearly leaving his post at Jezzy to come see for himself, until his companion frantically waved him back. Who is it? Pear's fist clenched so tight he was trembling, but it was his boot that was bothering him. So badly it wanted to kick that filthy face until all the soot and dirt came off, 
and he could see the dull expression of Lieutenant Colonel Lazen. And here I thought the insider was General Humphrey. So what does he know? Answer me. Lazen shrugged. Really nothing. I used him in his office. Convenience. He was quite useless. Clueless. Almost as useless as General Stumpy was. Humphrey's supposed to be in pools with you. He still is, but I got sick, Lazen said lazily. Came back early in the carriage. Why? Why betray the army and the world like this? Because Aunt Jessie pays more, Lazen droned. Aunt Jessie was shrinking and screeching now, trying to drown out her nephew's confession. It made sense, Lazen explained easily. In the army, I could see what Stumpy was up to, let Jesse know, and both of them paid me. It was a great run, but tiring, working both sides like this. I'm ready for retirement. Pear huffed. Ready for trial and probably execution? Same thing, Lazen said idly. Pear was hating him more each moment, and the urge to kick the man repeatedly nearly overwhelmed him. But there were, surprisingly, more important matters at hand. He realized the entire family was watching him, some with sympathy, others with disdain. The army couldn't even control their own man. One was working for Jesse in the mansion. Yes, High General Shin was doing a fantastic job. Pear turned to his soldiers, who were scowling in disgust at the filthy officer. Men, we were discussing the number of dead citizens. Here, there are more than 200 buried. What number did you come up with? How many do you think was listed on that report of dead citizens over the past 80 years? Together now. They watched each other as they said, 140 and the last number was mumbled a bit. The pair nodded once in approval anyway. For those of you not familiar with numbers, he said to the family, those living in this mansion have killed more than those living outside of it. Your enemies live here, and Clematis would have been the next victim, along with my son, correct? He looked at Lazen. He hesitated, then tipped his head in acknowledgement. Even my own son. You encourage me one day, then plan to kill my son the next, perceived. He bit back his anger and tried to keep focused on the task at hand. And your killing squad, created by Jesse, is waiting out there in the orchard, waiting for you to throw the body of this poor girl, suffocating and silent, over the wall for them to finish the task, along with nabbing my son. Now Lazen finally looked interested. How did you know that? The message, Pear said. The words on it, after designating that the sun blob be your target, also said east wall of the mansion at sunrise. No, it didn't, Jesse shouted. Yes, it did, Pear said coolly, because that's what I had added to it before your nephew here picked it up. Did Lazen tell you he was coming this morning? Maybe that's why you decided to do a two-for-one with your killing squad? Toss over another teenager, since Clematis was starting to get too nosy. So, Jazzy, you dressed up as a, I don't even know what you're trying to look like, but not yourself, I'm guessing. It's probably how you dressed up to escort your daughter-in-law out of the mansion. Go for a little walk or something. Then, in case anyone sees you, they'd never be able to identify you but would think she'd left with some dumpy old man. Then maybe you handed her off to someone supposedly safe, such as an officer, probably Lazen. Jessie stared up at a passing cloud, her chin jutting out angrily. At least Pear had finally found a way to make Queen Jessie stop talking, confront her with the truth. What about Clematis? How'd you get her out here? He turned to the girl. What happened this morning? I'm not sure, she said, rubbing her wrists where her mother had just unknotted the tightest scarf. I kind of woke up, but the scarves were already around my mouth, and Jesse and, and that man were tying up my hands and ankles. I was growing so dizzy I couldn't do anything, and I kept falling back to sleep, she added in frustration. 
Well, of course you couldn't do anything, Pear said understandingly. You were already suffocating. Then Lazen snatched you up. He and Jezzy headed out of the secret door in the hallway and were storing you under the mansion until all was quiet and they could toss you over the wall to the killing squad while the family was at breakfast. All of the noise we made looking for you changed their plans a bit. He turned to Lazen. Did I get it right? You're proving to be smarter than most of us in the garrison thought you'd be, Shin, Lazen said dully. Few people are going to regret installing you. Thought you'd be another stumpy. Blobby. Pear ignored him. If he was easily insulted, he'd never get anything done. It wouldn't be the last time someone made light of his weight or of his character. He knew they had low expectations of him, but that didn't mean he didn't know what was going on or that he was going to let things keep happening. The best way to counter insults, he learned some time ago, was to show there was no basis for any of them. By the look of startled and reluctant admiration in Lazen's normally dull eyes, he was beginning to succeed. That's the end of Part A. Part B will be next. Thank you.